Good morning. Welcome to the NIOSH Musculoskeletal Health Cross Sector Program webinar. My name is Jack Liu, the Program Manager. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bill Ballard. Bill is the Director of Global Exo Technology Programs and Executive Director of the ASTM Exo Technology Center of Excellence with ASTM International. Uh, Dr. Ballard holds a PhD in biology from the University of Dayton, a Master of Science in Engineering from Rice State University, and a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering from the George Institute of Technology. Formerly, he was a scientist with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology and the Vice Chairman of the ASTM F48 Exoskeletons and Exosuit Committee. Bill spent um, the past 17 years providing scientific and technical advice to federal agencies, first responders, and international organizations on topics including exoskeletons, critical infrastructure protection, CPRNE detection, and first responder equipment. He coordinated federal programs that produce over 50 Homeland Security focused national standards and over 100 reports on first responder equipment. Bell has received several awards, including the U.S. Department of Commerce Gold Medal Award for Heroism. Bill, welcome. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for the, the warm welcome and, and saying all the accolades there. That was really kind of you. I wanted to thank NIOSH for allowing me to speak today. Uh, it's really uh, kind of you to allow me to have a little bit of time to talk about the Center of Excellence and what's going on with F48. And also a special thanks to your director, Dr. Howard, for being on the Center of Excellence Advisory Board. So I'm going to give uh, an overview today of the Center of Excellence, uh, an overview also of the activities going on in the ASTM Committee F48. And uh, we should be able to get uh, through most of this in about uh, as uh, Jack was saying, about 30, 40 minutes, and then uh, I'm open to questions about uh, both of these areas, and hopefully I can uh, help uh, you understand a little bit more about what's going on. So let's go ahead. So just a little background for those folks who may not know about ASTM. ASTM International was founded about 120 years ago. It's a standard development organization. Uh, it's a industry-driven standards development organization, and it's a, a neutral forum where everybody has a voice. And, and here's my uh, pitch to you for those folks out there who may not be involved with standards. If you want to make an impact nationally and globally, and you want to have your voice heard, and you want to connect to people all around the globe and experts and stakeholders in your area, standards is a great way to do that. Uh, ASTM, we have about 150 committees. And so, you know, across those committees, there's 13 plus thousand standards that have come out over the years. And we have members from all around the world, 135 countries. And we also have the ability to, uh, the standards that we produce to designate they, them as American national standards. Uh, we do that sometimes when it makes sense. Most of the time, our standards are global international standards. And so you can use them anywhere around the world. We take a consensus-based approach. And which means that everybody gets a voice, everybody gets a vote, uh, and we have a balance on our committee so that one one group doesn't have a greater uh, voice or vote than anybody else. Go ahead to the next slide. So I like this this slide a lot uh, because it kind of gives you this this picture of of how ASTM uh, helps provide sort of the infrastructure to get from one place to the other. And it gets you from sort of this technology or research area into the market. And this infrastructure uh, helps people to have trust. It helps people to have uh, greater access to market. And it, it smooths the process for industry to move from one sector of innovation into practice and into use out there. And now, sort of straight into the Center of Excellence. So we, we started talking about the Center of Excellence uh, as part of the F48 committee 
uh, a few years ago. This this idea was sort of um, moved around and discussed, and we we started thinking how could we really innovate this area and, and make a difference. And you know, out of this these ideas, ASTM took the step to stand up this center of excellence. And the idea behind it is to help people of all ages to pursue a high quality of life. And so that's everything from industry to medical to consumer to defense, helping people to be to, to use this technology in a safe and reliable way. And that's really what I'm going to try to, to hit hard on this, is that the center of excellence is really about safety and reliability. Uh, and, and, and all of that is on this foundation of trust. And that's what the standards are going to help us do is build this foundation of trust. And so the COG, while yes, it is going to be this neutral forum where we can discuss very difficult uh, issues like what is an exoskeleton? Is it a tool? Is it personal protective equipment? Is it a medical device? Maybe the answer is yes to all of those questions or maybe not in certain circumstances. But we need a place where we can have those discussions. I know that topic in, in particular is, is on the minds of a lot of people around the globe, especially around the idea is, is uh, an exoskeleton PPE. So we want to be a home where we can have those discussions and, and figure out what's the best way to go and also uh, help by providing guidance and knowledge to the community. The, the energize and connect portion of, of the COE is really this idea that we're going to have some resources, the resources of ASTM as far as like, you know, the infrastructure, but also monetary resources to stimulate new standards and education and other efforts to help the community. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about some of the, the, the funded projects that we're working on right now. This is just a, a snapshot to show you. Here's a website where you can find out a little bit more about the Center of Excellence. And as you can see, you know, front and center, it's about safety and reliability, which should be near and dear to your heart and eyes. This gives a little bit of background on what's been happening. So we stood the center up in October last year. Uh, we partnered with, with NIOSH, but also NIST and the Army uh, as far as our federal partners. And then we have some founding partners and through uh, New Stone Soup, which is a, a conglomerate of companies which has the Exoskeleton Report and Optimum Services, Optimum Performance Services also as a part of that. And so we have a team of people uh, that work in the center right now and looking at how we can help the community and, and provide better service. And so we've been forming up all the different elements to uh, provide things to the community and that includes setting up the advisory board and different subcommittees and building an R&D team. And so that's, that's what's been happening the last few months. And uh, we've been trying to get up to speed so that we can uh, provide different offerings out there. Just a quick snapshot here of who's on our advisory board. Uh, I mentioned Dr. Howard before, but we have uh, standards executive from DHS, Bill Matson. Connie Demian, who's the FDA standards executive, David Audette from the Army, Ken Anderson from Toyota North America, Hugh Hare from MIT, Jim Miller from Sarcos Robotics, and Connor Walsh from Harvard. And then on our innovation research subcommittee, we have a host of people uh, from F48 who are representing, you know, government, private industry, and and other sectors, academia also. And, and we're, that's what we try to do is have a balance of people so that we get, uh, you know, perspectives from all the different voices and parts of the community out there. This is an eye chart for you just to see, you know, if you need glasses like me, you know, and, and this is really just to give you an idea, not for you to read all these words on here, but give you an idea of the scope of the, the, the R&D that's possible in this area. Uh, is the COE going to tackle everything on this list? Probably not. Uh, things that make sense as far as from a safety and reliability and building market trust, yeah, we're going to try to see if we can stimulate research in these areas that lead to standards. And, 
And, and you know, just to kind of hit that point, when we fund an effort, whether it's research or for education, we're trying to get something that is a product for the community. For the research, it's going to come out either with a new standard, modify an existing standard, or move a work item that's kind of lagging behind because it doesn't have enough data or resources to move it forward. And same thing with the education. How can we provide some education or guidance that will help the broader community? So we're going to tackle things off of this list here to kind of uh, help the community in, in the ways where we can the best. This just gives you a little bit more specifics about some of the ideas that we're working on. Most of the stuff over on the left side where it's research the standards, these are the type of ideas we put out there. Uh, and you'll see we've got our request for proposals out there on the streets, which closes this Friday on the 15th. Uh, and these are some of the things that we need help with. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these are test methods. We need to be able to test exoskeletons in a, an objective way so that we can know, uh, are they safe, are they reliable, can they perform, can they do the things they, they say they do. You know, all of those types of things you need to answer. The, the, the items on the right-hand side, the education workforce development, there's a couple of them highlighted because those activities are either have been done or they're ongoing right now. So we've got a student paper competition. Uh, again, if you look on our website, you can find out about that. But that's open. Uh, I believe it goes through June 19th, if I'm not mistaken. And it's open to any student in, in a university around the world. And it's a paper about, and I've got a little bit more detail later, about how to design a safe exoskeleton. We did a survey of the ASTM committee members, and we're doing a survey, uh, which should come out in the next few weeks, of exoskeleton producers to find out really what the needs are and, and how we can best help. And we've got a number of other ideas in here to try to help the community. And we're going to see if we can pursue some of those over the next uh, several months and years. So this is a little bit more detail on the, the RFP. So, it's open through the 15th of May. Uh, we're going to try to do three awards uh, up to about 34K each. And we've, we've kind of outlined what are the key research questions as we understand it. And so how do we design in safety to exo technologies promote safe practices across the community? How do we objectively measure all of these things, the performance, the safety, reliability, quality, all of those types? of issues. Proper fit and comfort is a key thing with an exoskeleton. Uh, you wear this. It is, it is something that is on you. It's not something you just pick up and you can put down. You, you have, it has to be comfortable and it has to be functional and it has to work the way it's supposed to. And it needs to stay where it's supposed to stay on your body in order to work properly. So that's a key thing with this technology. Okay, sorry, just heard a little buzz there. The other part of this is uh, how do we determine what is the right place to use an exoskeleton uh, and what process should we use to determine where to use an exoskeleton? So that's, that's a, a big question. I know a lot of people have worked on that. There's been a number of uh, people out of the industry, they've tried to tackle that question when they were employing exoskeletons for different processes. You've probably seen in uh, articles about how exoskeletons have been used uh, for overhead work in the automotive type industry. And so that's a, that's a, a thing we want to try to help with is, is how, do, how do you do that? What's a process that everybody could use? And then they can modify that process to be more specific to their particular needs. But, Giving them some general guidance will, will help a lot. And, and, and as you probably read, uh, when you look at some of the standards out there, a lot of this fits in sort of the ergonomics and human factors areas as far as figuring some of that out. And then how do we share data? So that's always a big question. How do you share data? How do you move it around across the community? And you, you know, a rising tide floats all the boats here. 
And that's what we want to try to do with this information that's across the community that people have already done a lot of work. How can we use that? And then as we develop new data and new information, how do we best share that and give people access to it? And then how do we bring down barriers for business? Uh, how, how do we enable businesses to get their products into a market and for people to be able to trust what the businesses say that their products can and cannot be? And, and that's really a key part of, of why we do standards is to kind of help with those barriers like that. And also, you know, another key part of this not, not said is that, you know, how do you comp compete on a global stage? How do you have market access globally? We want to have standards that can be used anywhere around the world, and manufacturers aren't just having to test to a standard in every different country around the world just in order to in enter a market. We would like that barrier to be as low as possible. This is a little information on the, the student paper competition and the exoskeleton producer survey. Uh, so the student paper goes through June 19th. It's designing safe exoskeletons and exosuits, and there's a, a bit more detail about uh, some of the, the uh, information on this on the website about how you enter and, and, and what kind of formats and all, all of that is like a, a regular type of RFP. And it's open to students enroll full or part time, so that's a key part, associate, undergraduate, or graduate. And again, it's open to any student around the world. So if you have a student or, or a friend who is a student, please let them know. We, we'd be happy to receive uh, their submissions on that. And we're going to have a first and second prize, $1,000 the first prize, $500 for the second prize. And, and hopefully we'll be able to have them travel to the next uh, F48 meeting and present uh, their findings and their paper. So that would be wonderful. Uh, I talked a little bit about the producer survey, but what we're trying to understand here is what are the priorities for the producers? How can we best help them uh, from a standards perspective with some of these barriers and some of these issues about uh, testing and building trust uh, with uh, the performance or the safety of their product? And so uh, hopefully that survey we going out soon. Uh, I know there's a number of people from uh, the F48 committee that's kind of helping, uh, you know, develop that and make that into a, a useful survey. And as with all, all the stuff that we're going to do with the center, we're going to try to share that information as widely as possible. So you should see that in the coming months. So we had our first advisory board in the end of March. Uh, we did that board meeting sort of like this in, in a virtual sense, and it went really well. We had good participation, and here are some of the, the uh, we kind of called out some general recommendations about where we can go with the center of excellence. And one is uh, building a roadmap, and, and I would welcome NIOSH's uh, views on some of the areas we can help the best uh, as we're building this roadmap, uh, because we think that you know, we want to keep a, a close partnership with NIOSH, and we think you can really help us and guide us as far as some of the areas where we can best help industry. Uh, they also recommended that we don't, uh, you know, as they say, reinvent the wheel. You know, we don't want to build our own uh, sort of testing systems and, and structures and, and, and everything if we don't have to. So leverage what other people are already doing and see, you know, how we can connect those together and, and get better information out of all of them. And then as we're developing how do you test an exoskeleton, they, they recommended looking at a task-based approach and also looking at, at how you could use, I have specific environments, but I kind of think of it like use cases. How, how do you build use cases around that so that, that you can reach and have an impact on the greatest number of situations. Another idea was this idea of review of literature. So, you know, just like with, with any other thing, as you're developing any kind of guidance document and, and perhaps a regulation or any other thing, you need to do some background research and understand 
the subject. And so this is the same thing that's kind of needed as we're developing the standards. We have experts in the area that serve on our committees, but they need to know what's the latest information about this area. What, what do we know and what don't we know? And, and that was one of the asks here. Can the, the center help with kind of having a review of literature for these different areas that we're tackling? The use case scenarios I kind of mentioned. And then, you know, models, simulations, and similar technologies. What does that mean? We, we have the models that can give you some understanding of what's going in the human body. We have some models that give you an understanding of the mechanical forces going on on materials, and, and even some, some models that will help you design new materials. They're, that's great. The problem is that the interface between those two is not really there. How do you take a, a exoskeleton that has very hard and very soft and electrical, mechanical type components and all these things, and then look at that interface to the human body and what forces and stresses and other types of things go on between those two things. And you look at that in a static and a dynamic type mode. So, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to go on in that area, and we need a lot of help there. All right. So this is uh, moving on. We're going to go to Committee F48. And this committee was set up in 2017, so not too old, but it's, it's quite a bit older than the Center of Excellence, obviously. And so, this was really born out of, we started thinking about uh, how do we do this and how do we really uh, get more organized about the idea of standards, probably I'll say 2016. Uh, so I was at NIST at the time uh, working with Roger Bosselman and a few other people, and we were looking at uh, you know, the exoskeleton area and talking with the U.S. Army and others about this. And what we did at the time is we, uh, at the end of 2016, we pulled together all the different federal agencies and had a, a kind of a meeting on exoskeletons like, you know, what do you guys think we really need to do in this area? And, and what, it, what is your thoughts on standards and, and similar types of things, research for this technology? And to a T, almost every federal agency and organization there said, we really do need standards. We really need to, to do more in this area. And that's, that, was, that was very heartening, and it was also kind of unique because it's rare. You get so many agencies that really say, yes, we have to do standards on there. And uh, so me and Roger and others kind of got together, and we tried to figure out where could we do this. And so we talked to a number of standards development organizations, including ASTM, and tried to find sort of the best home to try to stand up this effort. And we had a, a meeting in 2017, early 2017, to kind of bring the community together, an international meeting, and again, got confirmation we need to do this. And that was sort of the genesis of the process to develop the standard committee, which got stood up in uh, late 2017 or fall. And so when we, when we did this, we had to think about how are we going to organize this, what's important uh, for the exoskeletons, and what are the areas that, that it sort of touches. And so uh, it came out to be really, you know, industry, of course, medical, but military, emergency responder, and consumer also were important areas to sort of consider as where exoskeletons could be. And, you know, in my mind, exoskeletons is a very horizontal type technology. It can touch a lot of different areas. And, and this sort of shows that. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, there's another uh, meeting later this week, and they're going to talk a bit about passive and active systems. What does that mean? You know, I will tell you in our definition of exoskeletons right now, we don't mention passive or active. We just we just mention a device that augments, enables, assists, or enhances physical activity, and the key part of that through some sort of mechanical interaction with your body. And so we 
we don't necessarily sort of break it out in that way, but I will tell you in the literature you'll see a lot of that. And, and most of the time I will say that kind of means that does it have power or is it uh, mechanical or spring type actuated? There, there's some nuances to that. And so, uh, but that's really what it means most of the time. The other thing is we talk a lot about physical augmentation or physical assistance, but there's also the cognitive thing. And the, the, one of the big issues that you may see on the research side is, is cognitive demand. Does the exoskeleton increase the cognitive demand of the per person wearing it, or does it lower it, or does it assist it? There, that's, that's a question out there. And we try to use, uh, uh, I'll use a DOD term, a cradle-to-grave approach with exoskeleton. You know, everything from before it's on the person all the way to disposition of the exoskeleton. And another key part of this that uh, really I think should touch uh, NIOSH uh, a lot is that exoskeleton, in my opinion, is very much part of Industry 4.0. And so, and, and that to me is about having connections between people, robots, cobots, exoskeleton, uh, software systems, uh, networks, all of the different pieces that might be in a industry type situation and there's data and communication flowing there uh, between those elements. And so it's going to be key for us in the exoskeleton area to kind of understand the software and the cybersecurity and the communications and the reporting and data formats and all that as exoskeletons enter into that world there and become a vital part of that communication network. Uh, in a sense, I often look at them as sort of as a platform to, to uh, put a lot of different technologies besides just physical augmentation. Move to the next one. Oh, just before I go on, this is a list of the subcommittees uh, that are available for if you would like to participate. It, as you can see, it kind of covers that life cycle approach. And uh, we have a couple of new ones. The insurance and liabilities, a new subcommittee that's just getting stood up right now. And they're a vital part of the exoskeleton community. The innovation and research one here, that one is our interface between uh, the Center of Excellence and the F48 committee. And they do a lot of, they vet all of our projects plus anything that we do with the COE, it goes in through that avenue there. This is just a little snapshot of progress. We've got uh, four standards issued right now. And then we have a whole host of work items. There's probably uh, a number more than I've got listed here. And a lot of these we're hoping will get balloted and passed uh, this year. And so you should see uh, a lot more on the left side here the next time you hear me. And uh, a lot of these standards that are being worked on are guides or practices. And again, that's going to help the community make some better decisions, we hope, with how they approach exoskeletons in a host of areas. A lot of this is in uh, either uh, performance area or the human fractures and ergonomics area. And this is just a, a last little thing about how the committee works. Uh, we meet every six months. Um, that's the, the major meeting where we get all the subcommittees and the main committee together. But the individual subcommittees and the task groups, they meet more often than that. Most of the meetings, just like this, are virtual. Uh, everyone is welcome to participate in this. And then I've got Pat's contact information on here if you want to join or get involved in some way. And, you know, there's a number of other committees uh, in ASTM, as I mentioned earlier, it's like 150 or so. But we work with a number of them that sort of overlap with the exoskeleton area. Uh, the main ones we're kind of interfacing with right now are E54, which is the Homeland Security application, uh, F04, which is medical and surgical materials and devices, and then uh, E08, which is fatigue and fracture. So 
there's, there's others on here we will probably work with, but those were the main ones we we're working with right now. And then we're almost right on time, which gives me just a little bit of leeway, and I hope you guys can see this. I'm going to show you a short two-minute video, and uh, hopefully this will help kind of finish things off for you. Can you see that, I hope? Uh, I don't know if it's playing on your side, but maybe not. Not playing. No, okay. Bill. Videos usually don't don't work. Okay. Sorry. No, no problem. Uh, we will we will move. So with that, I'm going to close and say thank you, and I will take some questions. Okay, great. This is Jessica Ramsey. We did receive some questions uh, through Adobe Connect. Uh, the first one would be, do you have anyone from a workers' compensation insurance company on the advisory board? Uh, we do not right now. We have, uh, we have some connections through, to uh, workers' compensation. We work a little bit with the uh, um, uh, Delia Treater, who's with uh, Workers' Compensation for Ohio, uh, and I think we've got a number of people that are slated to be on that insurance and liability uh, subcommittee, but we don't have anybody on the advisory board for the COE yet. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, do you happen to know what OSHA's perspective is right now about exoskeleton? Uh, that's that's a really good question. Um, so when I talk to, and I, I can't, so the first answer is I don't know what their current perspective is. I can tell you uh, what I heard from them in 2016. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a couple years, two years old. Um, and they were, they were excited that uh, we were going to start developing standards in this area. They were looking uh, for standards to get developed so that they could uh, utilize them as part of their guidance. Um, they, are, they are also, uh, and, and this is my impression, they're also interested, you know, how are exoskeletons PPE or not PPE? Uh, and so that, that obviously falls within their scope and their mission area. And what we hope to do as part of the center is kind of help give them some education around this technology and, and work with them so that they can uh, see how it fits into their uh, scope of, of their mission there. Okay, the next question is, um, does the student paper competition involve PhD students as well? Yes, yes, graduate students is on there too. I, I, maybe I went a little bit quick on that, but yes, any any student, part-time or full-time student, can participate in that. Great. The next question is, can you talk about how exoskeletons would help a warehouse worker? Right. So there's a couple ways you, know, you can look at this. And so an exoskeleton. Uh, could be used to help prevent a uh, muscle, muscle, muscle musculoskeletal disorder, sorry, my tongue's tied this morning, a MSE, musculoskeletal disorder, or uh, it could help uh, a worker lift more than they can right now in a safe manner. Uh, most of the exoskeletons are focused on helping prevent injuries, whether it's a lower back injury or other MSD type injury. And there are some that are looking to perhaps augment the strength uh, to some degree, uh, but a lot of this is about pretending, preve preventing fatigue and preventing uh, strains and stresses to the body from doing uh, warehouse work or other types of work. So, um, you know, there was a, 
Carl Zellick from Vanderbilt University. He's done a, a number of uh, research studies, and he had a, a talk uh, at one of the recent uh, conferences. And they looked at warehouse workers in particular, and what they found is anyone, even people that have a primary lifting job, they're lifting uh, of their time frame at work probably only about 10% of the time. And so the exoskeleton will be to help them with that lifting. But the rest of the time there, the other, uh, say, 90%, maybe 80%, depending on, the, on the, how the worker is using it, the exoskeleton is just going to be there and, and kind of stay out of the way. I, I kind of think of it in my mind as how, how is it helping the worker with their ergonomics? If the, if the exoskeleton is providing good ergonomic posture, providing guidance as far as good human factors and movement for the warehouse worker or any worker, and it's not causing any uh, harm to the worker or causing them to move in a way that would cause them harm, then I think it's going to be beneficial to them. And, and we are looking at that, and a, a number of researchers are looking at that uh, through their studies about how do exoskeletons actually do help people. I think it's kind of difficult to uh, do research where you're trying to prove, prove that any kind of technology or show that any kind of technology doesn't cause something. Uh, it's a little bit easier uh, when you're doing science that where you're focused on, let me show you what it can do. And I think we're going to try to to help with some of that through the Center of Excellence. And then to tie into that answer, the next question is, um, how do exoskeletons impact the emergency response industry? Uh, so musculoskeletal disorders, again, if you look at uh, EMTs, nurses, doctors, anybody that's involved with uh, the movement of patients, they get a lot of injuries uh, from doing that work. Uh, it, is, it is tough and difficult type work they're doing. And I think an exoskeleton may provide some help in that area uh, so that uh, these folks aren't getting hurt from just doing their normal job. Okay, so these are, these are really coming in great because they're kind of going back to back. So the next question is, would there be any differences to consider regarding exoskeletons for women versus men? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we, we learned, so I, I worked for many, many years in the first responder world uh, helping them with technology. And one of the areas that, that I helped with uh, was with uh, ballistic vest or PPE uh, was another name, but really ballistic vest. And we we took you know that technology went through a lot of hard roads because it was basically designed for a man's frame, and it's taken years and many many people's diligent efforts to get that technology designed now for women so it fits correctly, uh, it sits on their body correctly. And I and I I tell you that story because. I don't want to repeat that story for exoskeletons. And so I want exoskeletons that are designed to fit men and women. And, and I want that thought to be up front versus an afterthought. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question asks, why is the study looking at overhead work and not above shoulder work? Uh, so that's a good question. So that's a, a, an industry-driven uh, type uh, research need because a lot of, in the automotive industry, you still have a lot of uh, vehicles where the workers have to, they move on tracks that are above the workers. And so the workers still have to lift their arms up and to do work there. Uh, and, and that causes a lot of stress on the shoulder joints. And so, Exoskeletons is one of the ways that different uh, automotive manufacturers have found that can reduce some of that stress on people's arms and shoulder joints. And so that's, that's why we want to look at it because the short answer is exoskeletons are being used for this purpose. We want to help provide some guidance uh, where we can so that 
the exoskeletons are, that are being used are, uh, there's some certainty to their performance and there's some certainty to their safety and certainty to their reliability. Okay, the next question says, what are your thoughts on standards development and acceptance based on regions of the world? Hmm. So we try to develop standards uh, for a global market. Um, I think from what I see that's going on in, in Europe, uh, there's, a, there's a number of efforts that have started in the exoskeleton area. They seem to be looking at very similar uh, issues and challenges like we've identified here. Uh, we have people that participate uh, from Europe and Asia and other places also. So I think we're all seeing the same thing. And what we want to try to do is coordinate with those other standards bodies around the world so that we can have harmonization uh, between uh, whatever may come out, whether it comes out from a regional body, say, uh, say Germany's uh, standards body puts out something on exoskeleton that is harmonized in some way with what we're doing. And uh, we work a lot in that area as, as ASTM as a whole to, to do that, not just in exoskeletons, but in, in all our committee areas. We, we try to do some coordination with bodies around the world so that that it helps lower the, the market barriers so you're not having to have different standards just because you go from one place, say from the U.S. to, uh, say, uh, India or something. You know, that's, that's the thing that's just built into the way that standards are developed these days. And then kind of a follow-up question to that, someone asked, um, you mentioned that NIST and other diplomats mentioned we really need standards. What was the general understanding of creating standards and on what? Okay. So a little bit of uh, history here. So when we were looking at exoskeletons, the, the Army had approached us to, to help them with what they were doing with exoskeletons and we looked at where they were going with things and what they were pursuing. And me and Roger discussed this, and we thought, you know, one of the areas that could best help them would be to get them some standards so that they would have a way to do testing. The exoskeletons were just starting to touch uh, and grow in industry use also, and so those two things were kind of going together. And so. When we brought the federal agencies together, it was not just to kind of, it wasn't just to say, hey, yeah, we do standards. You guys think we should do some more standards here? And it was a little bit more of also finding out what all of these different agencies were doing in the sexoskeleton area. And there were a number of agencies, uh, not just DOD, that were touching this area. And they'd heard about it or they were doing things in there and they wanted to know uh, how we could better coordinate uh, a government type approach to this. And so that was that was another part of that meeting. And then as we were talking about that, you know, people thought that the best avenue forward was through a, a standards-based approach and to get things like guidance documents and test methods out there. And so we sort of took the, the lead on trying to, to move that forward and make that happen, and that's what eventually led to uh, the F-48 getting stood up. Great, thank you. The next question asks, are the exoskeleton standards available for free anywhere? So there is a, a, a small charge if you buy them uh, individually, or if you become a member of uh, the F-48 committee, um, as part of your membership, uh, you get all the F-48 standards, you know, however many there are as, as part of that membership cost. Uh, the membership uh, for students is uh, free. Uh, the membership for regular uh, people is $75 a year, if I'm not mistaken. And I think the individual cost, uh, I would have to look, but I think it's uh, for the individual standards, 
I believe it is around $40. It's, it's, it's somewhere around there. Okay, we have a few more questions and a little bit more time, so we're going to keep going. The next yes, question says, as important as the effects on the body are, the characteristics of the types of jobs for which they are suited and not suited, a lot of that has to do with benefit versus discomfort and effort to put on and take off. Will work right. suitability be in the standard? Yes. Uh, I think that's absolutely necessary, having work suitability, task suitability. Um, so you, you, there's a lot of things you have to think about when you're thinking about employing exoskeletons in any type of situation. So if you look at an industry situation, you can look at the task, and that this is what people are doing right now. They're evaluating the task. They're looking at the ergonomics of that task or the hazards of that task, so using the the hierarchy uh, type pyramid that NIOSH has, of course, but they're looking at, at the hazards, the ergonomics of the task, and seeing, okay, how can we uh, make this safer and easier for a worker so that they can do their job better and go home in, in the same manner that they came here today? And so as you're looking at that, exoskeleton becomes one of the solutions that's possible in that area. And then, if you say, okay, this works for that task, will an exoskeleton fit in this environment? And, and that question can get very complicated very quick. It could be everything from as straightforward as, you know, it's got some, some pieces that sort of hang out from the side of the person. Will it fit in the environment where the person has to, has to be? Is, will it catch on things around there? Or is it going to be culturally acceptable for the person to wear that. And sometimes that is a bigger challenge than all the other things. It's fitting into that, that cultural work environment and getting people willing to try it and to use it. Uh, the donning and doffing is a, is a huge issue. It's a, also a, a huge safety issue of how can I, if I wear this, can I get out of this or can I run with this in order to evacuate? Walk quickly. I won't say run. <laughs> Perhaps we shouldn't tell people to do that. But walk quickly if I have to evacuate in case of a fire or something like that. And so those, the, there's many aspects to that, and that's a great question. And those are the types of things that we talk about a lot in, in the Standards Committee, the F48 Committee, and how do we help people think through that and give them good guidance on those. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you, Bill. And actually, another, I think, good follow-up question that came is, have there been any studies for exoskeletons in poultry plants? Hmm. I have not seen any. Um, I can't say that there might not be, but I have not seen any. So one of the areas that uh, I know a friend of mine is, is looking into, and he, he's done a, a lot of research in this, is, is vibration. And so that that may touch on something like a poultry plant or any other place where you're, you're doing uh, things in an environment where you're working with different uh, machines and tools and, and the like. And so um, I don't know about the poultry plant, but I, I know there's been a number of studies done in, I'll say, uh, agricultural type situations. Uh, there's been uh, manufacturers like John Deere and, and others that are looking at exoskeletons as a way to help some of the workers in those areas. And so I think it's, it's relevant and it's something worth looking into of how we could help people in those areas that have jobs that have a lot of manual labor in them are always ripe for use with exoskeleton. Okay, and then we have some questions regarding how much exoskeletons weigh and how much they cost and if the cost is coming down over time. Right, right. So this this is this is one of my favorite questions. So, uh, and and I'm I won't answer it directly, but I, I will try to get around to this. So, my favorite topic on um, exoskeletons, and I and I think we don't talk enough about it, is power to weight ratio. Uh, my other favorite is center of mass, because I think those two things drive a lot as far as the safety, the reliability, and the capability of exoskeletons. 
is the is the price coming down on exoskeletons? I think that's the goal of a lot of people. Uh, one of our members of our advisory board uh, has a goal, and and he he does uh, a lot in this area. I, I won't out him here, but he does a lot in this area. He he would love for this to be able to. Uh, be just like any other aid you could buy at, at a pharmacy or something where you could you know, someone could use it pick it up there at a reasonable affordable cost and and help them you know if say your knees aren't working so good or you're you're scared of stairs or you know you have trouble getting up from from your chair or something someone could go to a pharmacy and get one of these devices and those problems wouldn't be there. They could go visit their their grandkids or go run out in the yard a little bit. You know, there are things that would improve people's lives. And so I think this idea of having exoskeletons be affordable and not these these devices that are you know thousands and thousands of dollars. I think that's on a lot of people's minds. Great, thank you. I want to combine a couple of questions that are asking about specific industries. So the two things that were asked are, are there, have there been any successful tests in the grocery and supermarket industry? And then also, would an exoskeleton be helpful to a truck driver or in the trucking industry? Right. So I do not know of any tests in the uh, grocery industry. Would it be useful for a truck driver? So if you're a truck driver, you spend a lot of time sitting. And you, you have a lot of uh, vibration. I, I don't know if, if people have been in a truck before, but uh, it, it shakes you a lot. And I think there's a possibility that they could help with some of the, the postures there, I, I, I'm not sure uh, how it might work, but there's a possibility there because, because truck drivers and others do have those forces on them. It's something someone could look into. Uh, could, could it be better than what they're already doing as far as designing the chairs and seats in trucks? I don't know. Um, if it was focused on uh, helping them with some of their tests when they're outside of their truck, as far as checking uh, tires and connecting uh, the, the semi-rig together with the trailer, um, maybe, maybe there, there might be something there. But I think, you know, from an uh, ergonomic and postural standpoint, that's probably the first place someone could start. Uh, but I haven't seen any that's been offered in that area, like the, the, the closest has been more for the, the manual physical type things where people are, are, are either working on a line, standing, or if they're sitting, uh, they're, they're using the exoskeleton to kind of help them rest and sit with versus having a chair uh, that they're already in. Uh, one of the, the concerns uh, and, and areas that people are looking at is if someone has to get in and out of a vehicle a lot while they're wearing an exoskeleton. And so that's a design consideration for people making exoskeleton is if this is designed for someone, say, working in a warehouse and they have to get in and out of a forklift a lot or some other vehicle, will the exoskeleton get in the way and, and how can we make this so it works best? I hope that sort of answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got two final questions that seem to be kind of follow-ups to some previous questions. The first one is going back to the difference between above shoulder and overhead work. And I think the question is um, the usual exoskeleton supports the area of the body and provides support whenever the elbows are close to shoulder level. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, so the, the, the overhead uh, exoskeletons, one of the ways they do work is they provide a support sort of uh, near your elbow and underneath your arm so that when you have your arms above your head, they're giving you a little bit of support so you can kind of rest on them. Uh, 
they they do give you uh, they can give you like a little bit of boost because uh, they're uh, they tend to be a, at least the ones I've worn a little bit of uh, like feels like a spring type thing. It gives you a little bit of boost as you're lifting your arm up, but uh, most of the ones I've, I've heard about is really more about giving you that sort of postural support so you're not having to fully support your arm and do the, the work and task above your head by yourself. I hope that kind of answers that question. Okay, um, and so going back to the question about downloads, um, is there also a way that an institution can access the standard, such as a university library requesting it, I guess, or would they still need that um, membership? Yes, yeah. so yes, there's a way to, to do that. Um, I don't know the, I don't know the the exact cost with that, but I, I will tell you my experience with this. So when I was at NIST, NIST had a, a membership with uh, ASTM, and that membership was, I will call it, at an enterprise level. So basically we had access to every standard that was issued by ASTM. So not just with, with F48 or the areas around F48, it was every standard. So I think a library or another organization, they could uh, talk to the sales team at ASTM and figure out what makes best of whether they want a access to every ASTM standard or just a subset of those. So I, I think that's definitely doable. Okay, and then one last question. We've got about three minutes left. Um, has a study of exoskeletons been evaluated with respect to the different manufacturing philosophies, for example, lean manufacturing? Uh, not that I'm aware. Um, I think one of the big areas with, with design and manufacturing of exoskeletons um, that I've heard that's on uh, several people's minds right now is quality. And so a lot of exoskeletons, even though they may be producing numerous versions of a model, there's there's some differences from, from what I'm hearing between those exoskeletons. So the, there needs to be a little bit higher quality control, uh, and, and it's one of the areas we want to help with so that the people that are manufacturing have better ways to do that quality control so there is less variation from one exoskeleton to another. Um, and so that's, that's another area that we, we think we can provide some value in and really help the, the manufacturers there they're doing a great job with designing and, and integrating and building, you know, good prototypes and good demonstration models. But how do you go from there to a scaled up version where you're producing hundreds or thousands of these things? And that's always a, a, a difficult challenge with any new technology like this. And so we want to be able to help them. Okay, that is all the questions that we have. Um, Jack, I'm going to pass it back over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Belowski, for your informative and wonderful presentation.